So um, this is a, a, um, uh, uh, the, the cohort that we've been uh, studying. This is some time ago now. So remember that we are collecting data at 10 times uh, between the ages of 2 and 24 months. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 24 months. The ascertainment is done at 24 and 36 months. Um, um, and here we have over uh, 1,000 assessments. Uh, 59 children were at high risk for autism, meaning that they were siblings. Um, and of those, um, 13 uh, develop uh, autism. I'll not, I'm not going to be talking about the girls because we had only two girls. So I'm going to only talk about the boys here today. And there are 51 babies uh, who are low risk. Um, basically, those are children who are ascertained later as typically developing. And so we end up having 11 who develop autism and 25 who are typically developing. Now, and these are the kinds of things that they watch. Uh, we love the Italian approach, not the German approach. We try to do the naturalistic thing. So this is what they watch. Hi, baby. Did you just wake up? Oh, um, there is sound, actually. Let me see a smile. Give me a nice big smile. <gasps> OK, so there are about 30 of those clips of mothers uh, in sort of trying to engage their children, OK? Anyway, so here we go. Uh, so what did we do? Uh, well, we discovered that babies can be very variable in the way that they watch those things. And so um, uh, the, the blue line here goes from 2 to 24 months, okay? And this is percent fixation to the eyes. Now, there is tremendous variability, and so we use something called functional data analysis, which is a way, it's like a growth, uh, a growth curve analysis, but what it happens is that it allows us to maximize the connections between month to month to month to month for a single child which basically means we're now capitalizing on the correlations that happens from month to month. Uh, we realize that doing cross-sectional work is hard because the children vary over time. Okay, more about that momentarily. But you see, if we do that, we can conquer the variability. And what happens is that you have now uh, that blue line, which is for one typical child, and the red line that is for one child of autism. And here is another one. So it's possible to differentiate those curves. Here you have another example. And here we start sort of bringing some curves together for the different children. So this is what we're doing. We have those growth charts of social engagement for uh, the first 24 um, um, uh, months of life. And um, we have fixa percent fixation to the eyes, to the mouth, to the body, and to object. Okay? And so uh, when babies are little, they love to look at the eyes and much less to the mouth, the body, and the object. But these are now growth curves. And what you see is that there is some variability. And with time, uh, the children, these are typical children, by the way, they will be looking more at the mouth. And they start at a time in which they are learning what? They are learning to speak. And so in many different ways, we are able to disambiguate the sounds by actually looking at the mouth. And that happens at a time that they are going through this period of, um, uh, of uh, phonological development by the time that there are 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 months. But those curves give us a sense of actually what is happening with these children. Um, so here, for example, is eye fixation for the typical children. Now, what is happening to the children who eventually develop autism? They start way up here, and they go down. More about that momentarily. Um, now, we realize that uh, those curves are very interesting, but this actually is even more interesting. What is this? This is for the math buffs. This is um, the first derivative of those curves, and it's the rate of change. So not only what they are doing, but how much they are changing from time to time. It's interesting because it denotes a milestone that they are about to achieve, that they are working towards. Okay? So this is for the typical children, and this is now for the, uh, the two-year-olds uh, with the uh, children with autism. You see that it's going down, so the rate of change is always going to be negative. Okay? And you create almost a separation between those two distributions. Um, and you, know, you do a function one over, and you find that those two curves are significantly different. Now, this is for mouse. Now, uh, uh, for mouse, we don't have a difference. But uh, we did some work last year on biological motion. And our hypothesis here is that even though those curves are reflecting the same percent of fixation, but is actually doing something very different for the typical children that it's doing for the children with autism, and more about that momentarily. Now, this is what happens with body fixation. Interestingly, you have a very, very sort of dramatic decrease here in body fixation in typical children, okay? And this is particularly shown here in the rate of change, in the derivative, in the first derivative. So in the first, uh, say, six months, nine months of life, 
uh, the rate of looking at the body is dramatically dropping in the typical children and not as dramatically in the children with autism. What is happening with object fixation? Well, that was an interesting one. Um, we obtained almost uh, a, a, a separation between the, two, um, between the two groups in the second year of life because the typical children are spending less and less time looking at objects and the children with autism are looking more and more. And people ask me sometimes, is that because they are born with something that is going to attract them to objects? Well, the attentional system is a finite system. If you have attenuated engagement with the social world, you're going to have an attraction for the other. And we often talk about the social and the physical world as slightly different because the social world, world has adaptive value to you. And what I usually do when I'm teaching my students, I say, how many of you have counted the number of light fixtures in this room? Not many. Okay. How many of you have seen Professor Rizzolatti in this room? All of you, right? He was giving the lecture just a moment ago. But that's the idea. The physical world and the social world, they come in this way. The social is much more adaptive. And this is critical for us that we can actually differentiate this group as they grow older. Now, here are the curves that we have for the typical children, the blue ones, and for the children of autism, the red ones. I can do that this way. Um, now, um, this uh, here, at 24 months, we replicated uh, some studies that we did in the past that the children with autism, they are spending less time looking at the eyes, more time looking at the mouth, and the typical children are spending more time looking at the eyes. Now, uh, this was interesting to us. These are three, difficult, three different children with autism and what they did in terms of percent fixation to the eyes in the first 24 months. But what we're trying to do is to see if this measure was any, at all clinically, um, clinically relevant. And so uh, we use something called the principal component analysis in order to find out... Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, here is the, 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 the mean for the group, and you have those individuals whose principal component scores were higher or lower. And each child had the principal component score. It basically how much engaged with the eyes they were. And so when we did that, we found out that we could basically um, uh, uh, account for um, about over 65% of the variance of how autistic they're going to be at the age of 24 months. And so we felt this is nice because here is an experimental measure that is basically predicting the level of social disability, okay? And here is what I mentioned to you before. This is now a curve for the children with autism as, as percent of fixation to the mouth. And interesting enough, uh, the more they look at mouths, the more autistic they were. Now, in the study that we did biological motion last year, this was very much so. And what we realized is that children uh, spend so much time looking at people's mouths because of the audiovisual synchrony. People um, speak, and so the lip movements and the speech sounds are covary or they are synchronous. And our children, the children of autism, tend to be very driven by this kind of a thing. Um, well. Next was, um, was something else. We decided that we're going to try and see what we could do in terms of the first six months of life. Basically, now we drop all of the data for anything that happened after the age of six months, and we conducted the same kind of analysis for data for the first six months of life. And what you have here are the curves, the blue, the, the typical children, the red, the children with autism. And here you have now rates of change of what happened in the first six months of life because these rates of change were creating more of a separation between the two groups. And so we created two distributions. The red one is um, the distribution for the children with autism. The blue one, the distribution for the typical children. We then created basically, uh, we removed the labels of the children and we created a distribution of probability of any child belonging to the red, basically to the autistic distribution, or to blue, to the distribution of typical children. Ooh, not so good. Um, could you press play for me there? Uh, oh, top, 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 top left. No, 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 this one, no, 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 no. Play. Oh, grazie mille. Um, okay. Um, so, six months. So, uh, you know, using this kind of data, we could actually calculate sensitivity and specificity, which is the classification of those children based on data of the first six months of life. And so, we, um, we could um, pick up 78% of the children that eventually became autistic, and of those that we had a screen positive, about 67% of them actually had autism, and, uh, and that was good for the first go. 
Now, when we look at another measure, which is basically fixation to body, those numbers are much higher. So now we basically have a sensitivity of 89% and specificity of 80%. Now, uh, for those of you who uh, like to do screening of, um, of babies in hospitals and you are a pediatrician, uh, these are very good numbers. Uh, a lot of our pediatric screenings have terrible, 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 terrible specificity. And that's why um, what we, of course, need to do is to use those kinds of measures and move on. If a child is screened positive, then needless to say, they need to see um, an experienced clinician. Um, but that's the idea, creating growth charts, uh, identifying disruptions in a normative process of socialization, and using those quantifications to detect risk in the first six months of life. So my colleague Warren Jones and I have this dream. And uh, this dream is basically we take our lab and we deploy in the community. And so we are working on this prototype of um, what is basically a little um, piece of lab that we're going to be deploying uh, in, um, in primary care centers where we can use those very low cost uh, uh, assays. Those assays take about five to six minutes to obtain in order to um, try and screen children for risk. Now, uh, first thing I told you is that that measure seemed to be clinically valid in that we are basically predicting level of autistic symptomatology. The second thing is that we could use this information to detect risk for autism in the first six months of life and classify those children. Um, number three uh, was this uh, eye curve. Why I was so interested in this eye curve? Because, um, uh, you know, I thought that our children with autism were born without those mechanisms of socialization. But if it was so, then their percent of eye fixation would be flat. There would be no change whatsoever in the first 24 months of life. They're basically not sensitive to the eyes. But that's not what happened. Um, they actually start way up here, and then what you have is a free fall. Now, for the developmental psychologists uh, or developmental cognitive science among you, you know that a lot of those mechanisms of socialization, they go through this two-stage period in which you start with what is actually a reflex. And that reflex happens when you're born for the first hours and, and sometimes, uh, you know, days of life. And then you go through a period of experience, expectant learning. Now that you have the reflex and you're reorienting to people, you are learning about others. Um, you know, it's a little bit like chicks. You know, chicks like chickens. Um, they are born, they orient, they have a reflex to orient to anything that reminds them of mom. But then over the course of the first days, they, of the first day of life, they develop imprinting, which is filial orientation, is filial memory. And what seems to be happening here is that our kids, they are born with that reflex, but it basically has no traction. Interesting enough, 25, 30 years of neuroscience of chicks and imprinting tell us about what are the specific um, genes and gene expression mechanisms uh, that uh, seem to be associated with video imprinting. We are very interested in those compounds because many of those, particularly the cell-cell adhesion proteins, are just the kinds of things that have been found to be um, implicated in, in autism. So we're very interested in this kind of phenomena. But most important, uh, what we are really interested in is in using those kinds of quantifi quantified um, phenotypes to study what's happening in these children in the first uh, two years of life. Um, for example, I can tell you that um, about 20% of siblings of all children seem to develop autism, but there's another 20% or so that have something that reminds us of autism, and we don't know where they're going to, find, where they're going to end. And so one of the conversations I have with my friend Sally here is that this is a period of time that we may get children over the hump. Maybe we can get children to basically master some of the skills that are necessary for them to be unaffected. That's very exciting for people who have been in this field for quite some time. Now, this is just one behavior assay. We need to think about others. So, five minutes, I finish. Um, now, uh, we love naturalistic. So uh, this is the kind of stuff that, um, that we put for the children to watch. Remember that our kids have the greatest disability, the more naturalistic the situation is. So going, for example, into a high school cafeteria, they are lost, even though they may have the most incredible conversations with you in other settings. So this is what they watch. You know, your typical experience in a daycare. 